My guest today, Anna Pinedo Apaun, helps unravel some of the background to the accredited investor standard and the case for and against how it might change going forward. Welcome to the National Real Estate Forum podcast, episode 229. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Dr. Adam Gower, and this is the National Real Estate Forum.org, where I speak to leaders of the crowdfund real estate industry so you can learn how to raise capital, build wealth, and earn passive income from crowdfund real estate deals. One of the key changes brought about by the Jobs Act was the removal of the prohibition against general solicitation, meaning sponsors could advertise. One restriction that does remain, however, is that only accredited investors can participate in many of the deals out there. You already know, of course, that to be considered accredited, you need 1000 of income for the last two years and a reasonable likelihood of earning the same this year, 300000 if you're married, or a million dollars of net worth not including your primary residence. But did you know that this standard was promulgated in 1982, only a few months after the prime rate hit an all-time high of 21.5%? Imagine that. You could actually earn 12% on deposits at the bank. Mortgages cost north of 20%. There is a slow movement towards changing the definition of the standard, and any changes that may occur, as you'll hear today, could come about sooner than you might imagine. Track it with me. It's an interesting subject. By signing up for the News Digest at the National Real Estate Forum.org website, nreforum.org forward slash Anna, and I'll be sure to post updates as I hear of them. My heightened interest in the accredited investor standard came through reading an article written by my guest today, Anna Pinedo. Anna referred to a speech by SEC Commissioner Perth, who, among others, believes that the standard ought to be either abandoned or substantially modified. The case Commissioner Perth makes for it is multifold. By having an income or wealth hurdle to investing, it excludes 90% of the population from these investments. It prevents people from choosing for themselves what to invest in. It's an infringement of economic liberty. And as it's determined by relative cost of living and not relative financial sophistication, investors tend to be concentrated in larger coastal cities, i.e. it's not really a democratic process. Anna is a partner at the law firm of Mayor Brown, and I asked her if she could cast some further light on the standard and the case for and against. I'm a partner in the New York office of Mayor Brown, and I am a co-head of the firm's capital markets practice. So I devote much of my time to counseling issuers, counseling placement agents, underwriters, other financial intermediaries when they are thinking of sharing a financing transaction. So that might be a private placement to accredited investors or institutional accredited investors. It may be a public offering. So securities offerings are you know, an important component of what I do. And so the impact of the Jobs Act obviously is something that made some significant changes. Oh, absolutely. You know, I think people sort of focus too much attention on the Jobs Act and its its effects on the IPO market and sort of neglect mm. to talk about the Jobs Act and its effect on exempt offerings, both on private placements, Rule 506C, matchmaking platforms, Reg A, crowdfunding, and and probably even more important, just the ability for private companies to stay private longer, which obviously is is now something that we which obviously is is now something that we read about almost daily when when we commiserate about the declining number of of U.S. public companies and and the relatively small number of of U.S. IPOs. Okay, so that's interesting then. That wasn't actually on my agenda to talk about, but you bring it up and it's an interesting point because I don't know if I mentioned in one of my emails, I'm actually writing a book that's going to be published by Palgrave Macmillan later this year that covers the very origins of the Jobs Act and what happened afterwards. One of the commentators for that is David Weald, who was at the time vice chairman of the I know NASDAQ. David. You yeah, do? David's a good so friend. He, mm-hmm. Okay, good. So his main thrust then, was particularly focused on the lack of IPO activity, particularly for small cap companies. So I'm 
just I don't want to get too off subject. I really do want to concentrate on accredited investors. Wait, it's all yeah, it's all quite closely related though, right? Okay. So I think mm. I think the worries of, for example, Commissioner Piwar, who I think was one of the first to suggest it about perhaps doing away with the accredited investor standard or the the more recent comments that Commissioner Peirce made regarding accredited investors, it all derives from the same sort of public policy concern, right? Do we need, do we need the standard, the accredited investor standard? Is it helpful? Is it still serving its purpose? Or if you were to take the other view, if you were to take the Commissioner Pewar view, um, shouldn't, if companies are staying private longer and companies are experiencing more of their growth these days while they're private instead of in the years that immediately follow their public offerings, essentially doing a harm by not allowing a greater percentage of the investing public to participate in those offerings. So I think it's interesting to look at it from both angles. Okay, so the distinction then, just so that I understand it, because it's the first time I've heard it, David Wheel talks about the need for more IPOs. But what I'm hearing from you is the desire to keep companies private longer and therefore be able to raise capital from accredited investors or non-accredited, but basically from, from the general public without having to go public. Is that the point you're making? I'm making several points. Mm. So I, unlike Commissioner Piwar, I think there is merit in having an accredited investor standard. So okay. maybe let's start there and we'll get to the company staying private longer. I think there there's good reason to have an accredited investor standard. Okay. I think that the accredited investor standard. Okay. I think that the current standard, which includes some institutions, and I don't think that many people have quibbles about the prongs of the investor, the accredited investor definition that include that include non-natural persons. It, I think that's fine. I think what many have looked at is whether the two prongs that we now have for natural persons, the net worth test and the net income test, are still appropriate and whether those are good proxies for sophistication, for financial sophistication. Right. And I, I think in the securities laws, we have lots of instances where we use dollar amounts, assets as a proxy for kinds of individuals that can fend for themselves. So if you look at the definition of qualified client or if you look at the definition of qualified institutional buyer, qualified purchaser, any number of sort of investor standards that we have sprinkled throughout the securities laws, we've always sort of resorted to having these dollar thresholds be a proxy for getting at whether somebody has the wherewithal to bear some investment risk or could, if an investment goes sour, could withstand the loss. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. I think it's important to have bright line net worth and net income standards. I think that that's very helpful because it provides legal certainty because they're crisp answers, right? You and I can and identify, we know what those are, we know what those mean, they're not subject to judgment, they're easy to verify. And I think for broker-dealers, for investment advisors, having that clarity and that legal certainty is important. To stay on top of not only possible changes to the accredited investor standard, but to important events and updates in the crowdfund real estate industry overall, subscribe to my free News Digest on today's show notes page at the National Real Estate Forum.org website, nreforum.org forward slash Anna. Okay, doesn't yeah, answer please. the question of the need for the accredited investor standard, right? If you abolished it, or if you did away with it, then that line would be just as clear, right? That That is true. 
But just to finish off on the the standard right. and, and whether it should be revisited, sure. you know, obviously the Dodd Frank Act required that the SEC Frank Act required that the SEC periodically review the appropriateness of the accredited investor standard. The SEC did deliver a report on the accredited investor standard. There were some recommendations, which I think are, are sensible ones, that certain in individuals that have securities brokerage licenses or certain designations like a CFA designation mm -hmm. be able to be considered an accredited investor regardless of net worth or net income. And I, I think there's a fairness to that because they are sophisticated, right? There's an ascertainable standard. The CFA designation is you know, conducted over a period of time by an independent organization, FINRA administers the the securities licensing exams. So I think that's that's sensible. Things get very murky, very complicated when I hear suggestions that there be some test that gets administered that then becomes the basis for assessing, you know, whether somebody is or isn't financially sophisticated. I find that I find that troublesome. That's a test as in, here, take this quiz. <laughs> you, right, you get 70%, you pass. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, I think that even without doing too much thinking of different scenarios, I think you know, it's, it's pretty obvious that that can get complicated and that you're introducing many uncertainties. Well, yes, of course. But then, so when you look at the idea of CFAs or RIAs being considered accredited irrespective of their income or their net worth, doesn't that imply the income or their net worth? Doesn't that imply that education is important? If that's a qualification, if just knowledge is a qualification, how can net worth or income be an equivalent of that? Well, I don't think it's an equivalent. I think that their net income or net worth suggests that a person is probably going to be able to take certain financial risks. There may be a little bit of a paternalistic quality to the regulation, right? Deciding that we should only let those who can withstand risk of loss make an investment. But I, I do think that you know, it's important to have some proxies, even if they're imperfect. And I think that net worth and net income are imperfect, but there is merit to the notion that you can substitute net income and net worth as these are people who probably could with investment in a startup amounted to, you know, to zero, that they lost it all. I'd love to ask you, what are the arguments for and against abandoning the uh, credit investor standard. But before I do, let me just ask you, if you don't mind, the kind of the point that I make with the, the, my students, when I teach my students, I make the point that the accredited investor standard, with the exception of private uh, of personal residence that was embedded in Dodd-Frank, correct? Correct. That, yep. uh, that, right. So it was laid down, it was promulgated in 1982. Well, to betray my age a little bit, I actually remember 1982, and I remember that you could get 12% at the bank. And, uh, you know, if you got a loan, it was nearly 20% for a mortgage. The Dow Jones peaked at 1,000, right? I mean, it was a different era altogether, and yet the standard hasn't changed. So to be, to have a million dollars of net worth without primary residence, or to have 200,000 of income, in 1982 was a very, very different standard than having 200,000 of income today. So if one supports the idea that income or net worth is an important caveat for being able to fend for yourself, shouldn't those numbers be at least indexed to 1982? Maybe, yeah. Maybe that's a reasonable approach. We have inflation indexes in, written in to a variety of other you know thresholds so yeah there's there's a lot of of common sense appeal to that which would of course reduce the numbers presumably there were 550,000 or so accredited investors in 1982 and 11 million or so today 
So are there voices that think it would be desirable to see that kind of reduction again? I think... See that kind of reduction again? I think that, you know, again, if you go back to sort of some of those interesting public policy issues that are now coming about, Mm -hmm. I think there'd be some reluctance to limit the overall number of investors that are able to or that may participate in in private placements because private placements are have a more significant role in capital raising than than they did historically but then again if you know another way to go about things would be to require more disclosure in connection with certain private placements so mm. you could attack the problem in you know in, in any number of different ways so my broader question then uh, was what are the arguments for and against abandonment of the standard i read uh, commissioner purse's comments and she seems clear commissioner piwawa also has expressed on on occasion similar views would you mind just explaining to me what are the arguments for and against retaining the standard sure so the arguments for retaining the standard. First off, that the notion of our securities regulatory scheme is premised on there being investment decisions that are made when disclosure is provided. So, you know, Section 5, obviously, of the Securities Act, disclosure-based if there's a public offering, and then disclosure requirements being relaxed in the case of certain private offerings or certain exempt offerings based on the theory that you're offering to investors that are sophisticated, that can fend for themselves, that have the ability to ask questions regarding to have the ability to have those questions answered, So it presumes that we're not going to impose disclosure requirements or we're going to impose lighter disclosure requirements in instances where we're selling to certain types of more sophisticated investors or investors at least that can bear a risk of loss. So, you know, I think that's a powerful argument for keeping the accredited investor standard and for similar such standards that it's kind of built in to how we think about the securities framework. It, as I suggested, another alternative would be to modify or review some of the disclosure requirements that we currently have in other requirements that we currently have in offerings that are made to non-accredited investors. So in 506B transactions or 504 transactions, there are certain disclosure requirements, but, you know, are those still current? You know, hard to, and that's another way to, to skin the cat. Now, I think for those that argue in favor of just setting the accredited investor standard aside, there's a good story to tell. And that is that the capital markets have changed a great deal, particularly in the last uh, 10, 15 years. We now have private companies having the ability to go out to a broader universe of investors and to conduct successive rounds of financing and to become unicorns and essentially to become names and have some pretty dispersed ownership while still remaining private. And a lot of the wealth that's being built and a lot of that explosive growth that's being experienced by these companies is only open to institutional investors and accredited investors because in order to avoid disclosure requirements, most private placements are limited to accredited or institutional accredited investors or to quibs. So wouldn't it, from a public policy perspective, wouldn't it make sense, perspective, wouldn't it make sense, just as we once encouraged retail participation in IPOs to encourage broader participation in some of these exciting private placements. You know, I think that's the argument that would be made. Yeah, that's really interesting, isn't it? That does speak to 
Actually, what I spoke to David Wield about again was this idea that he wants to relax standards so that it makes it easier to become uh, to become public, to go public, that there are more IPOs. But your point is, well, look, you know, we've got facts on the ground, right, that these companies are doing very well. So keep them private, but open the the market for them to, for capital access, basically. It's, it's getting to the same result, but in a slightly different way. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So let me ask you a question that I don't mean to sound glib about, but I'm off, I often hear this. And that is, you know, why is there just an age? And that is, you know, why is there just an age limitation on gambling, but not in investing? Can you help me understand why that's not such a simple answer? I think the very name has answers it. It it is gambling. People understand when they take their seat at the craps table that they may walk away with a significant return or they may walk away with empty pockets. Meanwhile, I think it's all too easy for investors to hear about a startup with what they think is a promising business venture and to assume or perhaps be led to think that at least some portion, that it's an investment, right? That some portion of the money that they're putting up is not subject to complete risk of loss. To what extent do you have anything to do with uh, real estate, Anna, in your practice and uh, crowdfunding of real estate deals using job well, regulations? Yeah, not crowdfunding per se, not not regulation CF, mm. but we have helped with regulation A offerings for real estate ventures. And I know some people sort of loosely refer to Reg A offerings as a form of crowdfunding in the sense mm-hmm. that, you know, they are they're using the internet. Well, that's right, and that was the the real impact on real estate as far as I'm as far as I can see, is the authority to advertise. I mean, it's as simple as that. You couldn't do that before, but now you can. And that's exactly. really what, that's just what changed everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So let me ask you then, what is the process by which the standard can be changed? Anna, and who are the key influences it come about? You've talked about the SEC. I just read an article about Treasury. Is that synonymous? Because there's this list of recommendations that Treasury... Oh, in well. the Treasury in the Treasury report on capital yeah. markets. Yeah, mm-hmm. one of the several reports that was issued in response to that Trump presidential order. So yeah, the Treasury obviously is just making a number of, of suggestions, but it is within the SEC's domain to evaluate whether the definition ought to be changed or not. And <laughs> and obviously the SEC has done its work, right? The SEC has come has has completed its study. The study's been done for some time. You've got, there have been comments solicited from the public and submitted on the standard. The SEC's Investor Advisory Committee has kind of weighed in on the standard. And I think that the takeaway from standard, and I think that the takeaway from all of that is that I think most people would like to keep the net worth and net income, maybe with some indexation, maybe with some changes in the numbers, um, but also want to see added individuals who have certain designations. There's another recommendation to add knowledgeable employees to the standard, which you know, makes a lot of sense. So the the collective wisdom of the commenters, the Investor Advisory Committee, the SEC report, is to sort of keep it keep it intact, but make some changes. And so, what will be the process by which that will change? What what happens next? The SEC okay. would have to propose changes to the definition. And on the SEC's published agenda, the Reg Flex, I believe it's in the long term actions category is is consideration of proposed changes to the accredited investor definition. And what does uh, long term mean from the SEC's perspective? Not in the next 6 months. I was going to say our lifetimes. Okay. 
Okay. Not that long term. Okay, so it really isn't that long term then. Interesting. So that's just an agenda I that's just an agenda item that eventually floats up and then what, did they take a vote on it? Is that how it works? They ask for more oh, comments they, or Right. So they would have to propose a rule. The staff would come to the commission with a proposed mm-hmm. rule. The commission would take a vote on releasing the proposed rule for comment. There'd be a comment period. And then presumably after a time, the rule, after giving you know, weight to the comments, the rule would be adopted, modifying the definition in, in Rule 501. Okay. And where do you think, what do you think, just to kind of wrap up, what do you think will be the outcome, if I can ask you to predict something? Oh, I would think that it would stay substantially the same, maybe with these added categories. You don't see any reduction in the number of people. You see, if anything, it's going to be increased. Yes, that's my best guess. What are the key daily What are the key daily habits that you have that make you successful or productive? And there there have to be three of them? No, I have uh, three questions, but is, okay. is there a oh, daily habit? Yes, that's oh, question um, one. Yeah. The vast consumptions of caffeinated be- beverages. <laughs> All right, good. Um, That's the first time I've heard that. That's a very good one. Number two, what has been the hardest lesson you have learned in your career, work-related? Oh boy, there are so many, and 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 many of of that I've that I've learned or been reminded of only recently. Mm. Um, And and that is that people are always going to come to or draw whatever conclusions they're they're prone to do or they're inclined to without necessarily considering the merits of an argument so you can lay out an argument clearly and that you know won't necessarily win the day whether it's with a client or with colleagues or so while obviously it's important to to try and and you know exercise one's persuasive powers i think it it's hard to oftentimes to as a very analytical person, it's hard to accept that people are often, you know, sort of going to, won't be swayed by by very compelling arguments. Hmm. Yes, that's a, that's a very deep frustration, isn't it? I understand that. All right, so my last one is, uh, if you could give a piece of advice to somebody who has not yet invested as an accredited investor by the current standard, in a deal online, right, one that they could otherwise invest in, but was considering investing, what would be the advice that you would give that person? I'm sorry, if they, if they, I'm sorry, if they, if they want yeah. to. Yeah, so somebody that's not, not invested, that is accredited, uh-huh. but has, has not yet invested as an accredited investor, right? Oh, yes, these. Yeah, never done that. But now they're looking online and, and you know, my, my field is real estate. So they go to a real estate website and they see, I see. oh, look, I can invest in $10,000 in equity in this deal. I've never been able to do that. Mm-hmm. Should I do but it? Really, what would be your advice? Yeah, yeah. my advice would be um, to read some of the very good investor education pieces that the SEC has produced on its investor education, the investor education portion of its site. Likewise, FINRA has a number of really good investor education pieces just to understand the limitations associated with investing in in private placements, the concerns or general risks associated with emerging companies. And then, of course, to read the disclosure documents that they're furnished in connection with any investment, because I, I find that all too often investors don't. They don't spend the time really pouring through the disclosures that they're provided. Yeah, isn't that the truth as well? It's too easy to just click I agree, isn't it? Just get excited by the prospect of what sounds like a great investment and and not read the risk factors and not read some of the other cautionary language. Perhaps a better comparison than the gambling analogy I brought up when talking to Anne, is that anyone over a certain age, i.e. not income or wealth restricted, can buy publicly traded stocks. So why not privately traded stocks? A primary reason for this is that there are significantly fewer 
required disclosures, as Anna makes clear, right? is that there are significantly fewer required disclosures, as Anna makes clear, right? Everything you see online from any deal is part of what is really a sponsor pitch, which is substantially different from a fully disclosed audited report that a public company may present. If you want to better understand the deals you're looking at, I've put together a deep dive into a sample deal where I show you how to read between the lines of the pitch decks that you find online. It's in the form of a webinar and you can sign up for the next one by following the link at the top of today's show notes page at the National Real Estate Forum.org website, nreforum.org forward slash Anna. My next podcast guest is Jason Schwetz of Triple Net Zero, who is, interestingly, an introduction of one of my students. I tasked them with finding every crowdfund real estate site in the US, and one of them, Austin, actually took the initiative to call a few and recommended Jason as a guest. He was very right to do so, and if you're interested in low-risk, decent return real estate investing strategy, quite compelling, I'm sure. You can subscribe to the podcast series so as to be sure not to miss the conversation with Jason or any others by going to the National Real Estate Forum.org website, nreforum.org, and hitting any of the links that I've included about halfway down the homepage. Thanks for tuning in, and thank you also to Anna Pinedo of Mayor Brown for sharing your time with me today. Until next time, this is Dr. Adam Gower, signing off.